The idea for Kid Hood came about because I was, um, I'd grown up in an area that the film was set and I kind of had lived some of that life when I was younger. And I was seeing a lot of young people around those days just, just behaving in what I thought was a bit wilder than the way I used to behave when I was younger. So I kind of sat around for a while mulling over an idea that I had about putting some bits of my life together with what I was seeing. And then I saw a play. The writing annoyed me so much that the guy was kind of <clears throat> saying he knew about he knew about young urban street urban street culture and he obviously didn't and it annoyed me so much I went home and started writing. The characters in the film were try is uh, sort of based on me when I was younger and uh, Mooney J uh, and basically the activities they get up to are loosely based on myself and a few friends that I had and when I was younger and what we used to get up to. The girls, again, are just based on, on, on girls and, and people that I knew at that, that sort of time. And also some of the young people that I see, that I saw then or, or still are around today, just, you know, disrespecting their bodies and, and behaving in a way that is not, not the way that they were probably brought up to behave. I kind of wanted it to be a day because I wanted to get the impact of, of, of it being a, a quick period and how everything seems exaggerated to, to young people. Everything, no matter what happens, it seems like it's fast and it's quick and it's, <clears throat> it's always big for them. It's always big drama. So I thought that setting it in that sort of time frame would, would capture that sort of almost exaggerated feel from their, their eyes. I wrote the script and I had it sitting on my computer. Um, and I just showed it to, to a few friends and uh, one of the guys, uh, Ray Panthaki, said he knew a director called Hoods that he'd worked with on a short film called uh, Jump Boy. I first heard about Kid Alt Hood when I got a phone call from Ray Panthaki. I was in LA and, uh, and Ray went, oh, you know, I've got this script I want you to have a look at. Uh, so I was like, yeah, OK, sure, I'll send it over. And um, as soon as I read it, I was quite, quite blown away by it. And, uh, mainly because it was just uh, what I'd been looking for. I'd done this short film called Jump Boy, which everybody knew, knew me from, and I was looking to make a, a feature film, but with a very sort of hard urban edge to it. And here it was on my lap. And um, so I made that sort of decision right there and then that whatever else I was going to do with my life, I was going to make this film. I think within two weeks, Hood's, Hood's responded and said that he was interested in doing it. And then I think, a couple of weeks after that, he flew back from LA and we had our first meeting with him. And, uh, you know, he seemed like an all right guy. He was like, I'm going to make this film. I was like, whatever, man. You know, <laughs> if you think you can, if you think you can, go for it. It was a you know, great meeting. We all met up and um, had a chat. And um, I think the thing about Noel that you got right from the beginning is that he means business. He was just raring to go. My initial reaction was, yeah, here's a new talent. There's a new kind of genre. There's a new kind of film. And what is very likely to happen is I take, it, take the script to a producer and then we end up developing it for three years, five years, and then it's lost its, you know, it end up, ends up being a completely different story <clears throat> and it's lost that kind of raw edge to it. But what I, what I thought was you could also do is actually just tweak a few bits of it and keep the bulk of the script as is and just make it, you know, okay, it might have a few little holes or flaws in it, it's just one of those films that needs to just come out and, and, and get out because of it, it's of its time. It, you know, Britain has been waiting for something like this for such a long time, and here it was. And it was up to me to make sure that it happened in the best possible way. I've seen films like this from all over the world, but I've yet to see it out of the UK. And I just felt, you know, we have elements and stories like this in the UK and in London in particular, and it's never been exploited, never been used, never been shown. And I want to see that. You know, I knew that I could make a film out of it that was visually interesting as well as being culturally relevant. He had sort of ideas of the way he wanted the script to progress in terms of development. He really took on board some of the comments and notes that I had about the script and how I felt it needed to go forward. You know, since he was going to direct and produce, he came on board with some ideas. Uh, and we spent probably the next three months in, a, uh, in various rooms at his place or my place just uh, during the days just kind of reworking the script. Noel was ne never like precious with the script where he was just like, no, I'm having this and that's it, you know, because I believe in it. He was completely up for 
you know, consulting and arguing about things, and that's why we work so well together. That, that's why, you know, we both got what we wanted out of the script, and, and it never felt like we were compromising. I was going to produce and direct this myself because I felt, A, that would be cheaper, and B, it would be quicker. Um, and I, you know, that's something that I was pretty adamant about, that this film had to be made quickly. And, um, and so just starting to go out with it um, to the establishment in the film industry had a lot of interesting responses. Everyone seemed to get the script. A lot of people were scared of it. You know, they were very honest and said, yeah, this is too strong for us. It was like, you know, it was, the script was radioactive. You know, they just wanted to get it out the door as quickly as possible. They knew it was hot. They knew it was good, but they just didn't want to touch it. But luckily, you know, or maybe unluckily, you know, we had some good responses from uh, the Film Council and Film 4, the first people that came on board, and it looked like they were going to make it. We got a bit of money for casting and we started casting. They put up some money to uh, do this casting and a read-through, which is like where we found our main cast, as it turned out. Um, and that read-through, I think, was a, a really amazing experience for all of us, that first read-through, because it, it just proved to us that we had something special. It was entertaining, it was shocking, it was interesting, and it was funny. I don't know what Sam um, done, but he's not here, you understand me? He's Sam. And I didn't understand why, based on that, you know, these guys wouldn't go ahead with the production, but they didn't. When the film collapsed the first time, I mean, I was kind of annoyed, but at the same time, I wasn't, I wasn't that bothered, because, you know, number one, I kind of knew the film would, would get made eventually. And two, it was like, you know, you'd, people that aren't going to get the film, you don't want them making it. We then went back into development. You know, we did a, another three months on it. We ended up with a script that all of us were really happy with. And when we went back to the Film Council, they turned around and said, actually, we don't want to do this film anymore. You know, we're looking at February, March time, 2004. It was pretty much left out in the cold on my own. I was about to go to the States and remortgage my flat over there and, and take out whatever money I could and just start the ball rolling with that money. But in the meantime, I'd met this young producer called George Isaac. I had seen um, Hood's short called Jump Boy, which was very much what was needed from a director in order to translate this script into a, into a good film. And also the script itself, which I thought was unique, but the combination of the two was something that appealed to me. He's a young producer and he was like, you know, I'm really feeling this film, I'm feeling what you guys are doing, I'm going to make this film. And then he kind of, he kind of did, you know, he raised the money through, through, through private investors and, and, he, and he got the film up. So essentially he took over the role of putting the financing together for the film. And I'm trying to just basically give him as much support and resources in order to basically pull this project together. In the meantime, I, I'd made the decision, you know, which I guess turned out to be the right decision, that I was going to put the film into pre-production. My job is to spend money, and um, I spend most of my time not spending it. So this is like coming into July 2004, I decided that with the money that I had available to me, I would find the locations uh, with a location manager. I was going to finish off the casting and make sure that we had everyone in place. Hopefully by the time we got to the end of that process, the, the rest of the money was going to be in, in the bag and um, we can carry on and just start shooting. Hoods was determined to recast the film. I was like, dude, we don't need to recast the film. We got our actors, but he, he was like, no, I want to recast it, I want to recast it. The, the Becky character, the Mooney character, and the Jay character, the actors there, I've said from last year, they should just be offered the parts, but obviously, Hoods has to, has to, you know, to make the film the best it can be, he has to cast it. So I'm sitting here quite smugly and satisfied, like, you know, saying, I, I don't want to say I told you so, but I told you so, kind of thing. But no, but I, I, I would be, I'd be very happy if, uh, if we'd gone through the process and ended up with those same kids. Because yeah. it, it would just prove to me that, you were right that I was, was going to go into the production with the, the right kids. Yeah. I was quite opposed to this at, at the time um, because I thought that, you know, we had the people we had, but, you know, he had a valid point that it was a year 
it was uh, eight months later and some of the people might be different, we might, there might be new people. It was like amazing because it was something that I expected I'd never ever would happen to me. Bearing in mind it's my second job and it's my first really main part in a film because I've had little parts and it's not enough to get a buzz off, it's not enough to feed off. Because I was just doing A-level drama, didn't really have a thing in like acting, I didn't think I'd go in, like, into it and then getting the role was like really shocking. Because we ended up with I think five of the six kids we originally had but the most important part which was Alyssa we ended up with a new actress, uh, Red Madrell, who was actually was actually the best girl for the job. And if Hood hadn't asked for the recast, um, which he constantly tells me, we would never have found Red. I was like convinced I didn't get it because I was in a rush and I needed my script. So I was just, when I got told, I was really like, oh my goodness, it was a real big shock. I was so excited. I'd gone around telling everyone, oh, I'm in a film, I'm in a film, I'm in a film. I'd just gone around telling everyone, all my friends. The thing about casting a film like this is that it's, uh, you know, it's full of young characters who are quite street. You know, they, they walk and talk in a certain way. I've grown up with kids like Jay, and I just kind of thought in my head, I can bring, I can bring that to the screen. So there is no agency that you can just ring up and, and go, yeah, I want to get X, Y and Z to come in for casting, you know, to, to come and play these roles. I've never seen any characters like this in any other film in the UK. So you're going to have to go out and find these kids. We all went to this big kind of open audition in Warren Street and you had about 300 kids, non-actors. I hadn't written any part for myself, but at first when we started casting, I thought, oh, you know, it'd be good to play, play Trife, but obviously I was getting too old for that. I really wanted the part of Trife, do you know what I'm saying? I really wanted that character. And um, I, I thought to myself, a lot of people could play it. You know, I just kept thinking of other actors that I know that could play it, and I really wanted it, you know, I was hungry for it. So there was a bit of a, like, difficulty for me to go to the casting, which made me more nervous to know that everyone else knew each other, probably seen each other, practised, and I was there by myself. So it was a bit nerve-wracking. We had these open castings, we went to uh, colleges and schools and drama co courses, and essentially did all these workshops. It was a lot of fun, the workshops, and it kind of just, I just wanted to bring that kind of realness to that workshop, so I just kind of went for it. We then took the best of those and then gave them this one scene. Everybody had the same scene, and to see if they could actually read and you know, translate that uh, performance into a written scene. And then we took the best of those guys and girls and gave them the whole script and got them to come in and read for specific roles. And it's that sort of film where it's got to be real, otherwise it's going to look shit. <laughs> so, and the realer it looks, the better it looks. And these people are real, we're all real. And we're just doing what we know. Like, we know these characters because we've been to school with them. We've, we've hung out with them, we've seen them, we've had rows with them. I, I kind of said, well, I want to throw my hat into play Sam. And even then, Hoods wasn't, Hoods wasn't necessarily agreeing with that. Noel would be throwing himself into these um, um, improvised uh, workshops. And, uh, you know, just to help out and, you know, make the numbers uh, work. Um, he, he was kind of like, nah, you're too small, you can't play Sam, whatever, you know. So I kind of just sat back and said, well, I, I want to, but we'll see what happens. And I just remember seeing him the first time bullying these kids who were maybe slightly bigger than him or whatever, and I just knew that he had to play Sam. You know, that's, that's the process we used. I mean, I, I learned to do that when I did my first short film, and I did that on this film, and it actually works exactly the way we needed to, and we found the right kids. And everyone's got that sort of edge with them, like, is it going to go through? Is it, you know, that sort of fear whether it's going to happen, but I think we're all so excited that nothing can stop it. He called me at something like 8 o'clock last night, the day before the shoot, saying, can you fax me the list of deliverables? We're just about to sign off on the deal. And it was like, I was like, you mean we haven't signed off yet? <laughs> <laughs> We're shooting tomorrow. <laughs> First feature. This is my first feature. Uh, you know, so you know, we're both kind of uh, 
on the, on the juggernaut you know, filmmaking together, really, and we'll see where it takes us, hopefully. We knew we had about £600,000, um, and I knew how Woods likes to work and how he likes to shoot. And it was a question for me of coming up with a crew that will prepare to work under those conditions. I'm sure Brian would like to show the whole world what you can actually do on such a small budget. And Brian himself is an amazing DOP. And the way he frames stuff and his whole kind of composition of shot is you know, outstanding. And that coupled with the locations we've managed to get because we have a superb location guy and shooting it on 35 and being under the pressure we are in the 27 days is an amazing feat really, if we can pull this off. But there's a long way still to go. We shot the film using, what was it, two, two transit vans and a camera car, something like that. I mean, we just piled into these vehicles and moved around London from location to location, shooting and moving all the time probably one of the toughest schedules you could ever do 27 days 100 pages on a 35 millimeter shoot with 600 grand is bordering on you know probably the hardest thing I've ever done and I'm sure like most of this crew's ever done so but they're pulling through and that's uh, you know tremendous credit to the crew and to Hoods. Camera and action! And most of the places that I thought of in the script actually actually ended up in the film. This is Trias Room. This is Let's try to watch this. Thing. Which, in reality, Space. about yeah. well, years and years ago, was Space. actually my room. It's just what the script needed. You know, we wanted to shoot this film in West London. We wanted to shoot it in Larrick Grove. We didn't want to have to go to South London because it doesn't look the same. Now people understand why we had to do it like that because, you know, my location manager was going, oh, you know, if you want to do a scene like that, we could go to this place, it'd be much easier. If you want to do this, you can go to this place. And I'm like, no, but I don't want to go to those places. I want this shot outside the Labra Grove tube station. You know, I want to shoot it on the Hammersmith and City line. I want to shoot it at Royal Oak. You know, I want to shoot at Oxford Street. These are the places I have to shoot this film because it actually really brings you the look of the film. My favourite memories of the shoot were probably the first day when we did the, uh, the first two days when we did the school stuff. We did all the bullying stuff. Probably because it was like, you know, it was the first two days, you know, and it was like, hold on a second, this thing I wrote, sat down on my computer and wrote, you know, in between acting jobs is actually getting made and I'm in it. This is the first day and basically we had to meet here at we actually had to go to the studios for about seven. It's been quite a nice day. I've got to know a lot of the cast, the rest of the cast, like extras and everything. Like, we've just been having a right laugh, really. Because it was such a relaxed feel on set, you were able to just perform quite like well because everyone was so relaxed. The shoot itself was, uh, was great. I mean, it was, it was hectic because, you know, we were shooting on a, on a low budget and you had some people that weren't actors and, and, and when the boys got together, they could be quite rowdy. For me, playing the bully was, uh, was quite fun, you know. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. Not, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't like bullying in real life or anything like that, but as an actor, he's played you know, nice guys and, and scared guys. For me, bullying the boys was, was quite fun. It was also a way to sort of vent frustration, because when, when they were getting rowdy and and you couldn't always get them to behave, you know. I knew that I had a bullying scene coming up, I could really sort of slap them, slap them around a bit, <laughs> treat them with a bit of disrespect, which was, was always a bit of fun, you know. I, you know. So, so, so I kind of liked that. I mean, the, the only stuff I didn't really like well, go on, bitch. Um, as a person, and, you know, was, was the character, was, was bullying the girls. You know, Hoods is a very good director and he's uh, fully aware of what the schedule is and what we have to do and to be honest with you, he's doing, he's doing a magnificent job but I'm not telling him that because until we get to the end of shooting. All the people that were on my crew were people that I'd worked with before, my friends, 
I felt so supported and people just got on with it and they just did great work, you know. And I was just there making sure that you know, what I was getting was just gold dust. Working with Hood was was uh, was was great. I mean, he's a he's a quiet guy, but you know you know he knows what he's doing. You know he stays stays focused. People think I'm pretty low key on shoot and I don't say much. Actually, it's all going in through through my eyes into my brain, and I'm going, this is going to be amazing. When things are going wrong, then I'll shout and scream and go, you know, we need to do something else. Doesn't need to give a lot of notes and doesn't always give a lot of notes, but the no the, the notes he does give steer you in the right direction you know you know you, you know he's kind of one of those directors that will just watch more than anything but he only needs to say to you tilt your head to the left or tweak it or, or say that this way and then you would literally see the, the actors change their performance and you think all right he does know what he's talking about <laughs> well he's much better than i expected he's he's wicked he's just so on the mark about things he's straight he's like he will tell you what he thinks and he's got a very arty sort of way of thinking, I think, and I think that's exactly what this sort of creativity needs, like this sort of film. He nurtured me and he, he kept me under his wing and, um, yeah, he just, he just, just made me realise that this, this film can really make me and make a mark for me more than anything. He's dealt with us so well, like, he hasn't talked to us down like kids. He's talked to us like grown-ups and what he wants and hopefully we give him what he wants. There's a scene, one of my most demanding scenes in the film where I, I go as Trifer, he goes and cuts this guy's face. And that scene was really, really important to me that I got that right. I mean, I sat in my ho home the whole day and I was listening to angry rap music, you know what I'm saying, anything to kind of get me in the mood. And then I came on set and I didn't speak to no one and the director kind of supported me on that. He doesn't really get excited about too much, you know, he's quite a cool cat. He doesn't really get excited about much until, until he's seen what he wants. I'm saying, and then he just comes over to you and goes, yeah, you did it, yeah. In terms of directing that, for the budget we had, he made the film look the way it looked. You know, because you know you could you defy anyone to say it looks under two, two and a half million or whatever like that. And you know, it's just because people like Brian and Hood just just knew what they were doing. And if you have a team that knows what you're doing, and you have people that are committed to the to the job 100%, then you get the results. You can take a script and budget it and go, yeah, we're going to shoot this in eight weeks, and you know we're going to need this, this and this, and it's going to end up costing one, two, three million dollars. Or you can go, well, actually, we've got this much resources. What can we actually do? And by putting yourself in that position, I think it's a much more of a mental challenge. It's much more exciting and interesting. And actually, the film develops its own kind of nature and its own style, which a lot of American independent films have. And that's where they get it from, is because they do it, because they've only got the money to do what they can do. And that's what you... You know, you see the filmmakers overcoming this, and that's the interesting thing. And I wanted that on this film, and I think we managed to do that and pull it off. We're doing a scene in the bedroom with, with the boys where Sam comes home and discovers them in the room. You see you, Cliff? I'm going to shove this back so far up your pussy. I was meant to fall short of a hit when I hit uh, um, Sam on the head and actually clocked him. Pussy. Oh. And you can see he hits me and keys fly off the keyboard and, and everything and um, the reaction, oh shit. And if you see it, I'm like, oh shh. When they react, that's the real reaction of the actors. And there was a brief pause before I think Hoods or myself on the floor said, carry on, carry on. And then they started doing the stamping. So, I mean, the reason that scene looks so good when he hits me is because he actually does hit me. And the reaction he gives is real as well. But I got him back. Out of nowhere, Sam comes and hits some um, trifle and he knocks him down and they kind of padded me up with all these, these pa the pads and stuff like that. But I felt every, you, f you feel the licks, man. I was winded and, and Noel Clark, he, I knew he was going to go for it. Do you know what I'm saying? I knew he was going to give 100% and he had to. Do you know what I'm saying? Just like how we had to. And the, the pain was real. The pain in that film was real. When, you, when I'm getting choked to the back, I'm like, ah, Sam, leave me alone. And I mean, the pain is real. The pain was real. The whole sequence on the tube, the whole platform, um, on the tube, the bullies getting on, you know, them getting on the tube <clears throat> and then getting off and, you know, vomiting on the platform. All of that was done between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. on a weekday. Shooting on the hoof with a crew that was jumping on and off these tube trains. We had a carriage to ourselves and we would get on that, you know, and as soon as the train started rolling, we'd start turning over and start shooting. And as soon as we got into a station, we would stop 
And as soon as we went off again, we'd start shooting again. And we had to, and then when, on the way back, we would jump onto another, and then we'd all get off at Royal Oak. And everybody had to get off, all the crew, all the equipment, we all had to jump off and then get, go to the other side of the platform, wait for a train to take us back to Hammersmith. And we would then go into a carriage that wasn't ours and see if there was anything we could film on that and by taking over, you know. Obviously we had the London Underground people with us, so they were helping us. But doing that and going round, we did that, all the stuff on the tube itself, on the train, was done in about two hours. In the body cam shots, in Oxford Street at night time, um, or any, any of the Oxford Street stuff, was again quite extraordinary achievement considering what a low budget we had. But I think it really worked. You know, those body cam shots are sort of some of the more, more interesting visuals that we've got, and to be able to do it in such a well known location. And you know, one of the one things I love is when Amel runs out of Uncle Curtis's and he's just like totally running so fast that he's the camera's moving all over the place. But then when he, when he sort of bends down to vomit, you see these, these lights, uh, these big skylights in the background uh, up in the sky. And they're actually, you know, they look like, you know, we chose that location for that, but it just happened because that's the Christmas lights that we've got on Oxford Street that year. That's what they were doing. And it just gave that image such an amazing, quite kind of magical quality. The fact that we got to the last day and no matter what, it was all in the can and it was all there and we'd done it, that was... Uh, that was a nice day as well. The, the great thing about the film actually coming out in the, in the cinemas was it, it just proved all of us right. You know, we, we, we set off to make this film because we really believed that there was an audience for it out there. And, and, and it's the kind of film that kids want to go and see. It's the kind of films we wanted to see. But, you know, we were up against a lot of, lot of resistance from the industry to to not make a film like this and to conform to other kinds of films and we just ignored that you know we took we stuck two fingers up at them and just went ahead and made it and and we did it in our own way and and that's the the, the best feeling about when it actually came out in the, in the UK cinemas and got the, the amazing press it was the subject matter and the topical issues in the movie that were really create creating creating the attention you know, people were saying, are young people really like this? Does this really happen? Journalists were going onto, onto political programs saying no, and then young people were going, well, actually, yes. And if you paid attention to us, you would notice. And it just became this huge, huge sort of, sort of platform for people to discuss and talk, which I think was a good thing, because you know what? The whole point of the film, you know, I always said, if it got one adult talking to their son or daughter, then I'd done my job and the country was talking so for me that was a big deal it really made all of us go told you so that that is what we've been talking about you know i always knew that in the the weird realms of my mind that if a film i wrote ever came out and it was this film that it would do what i knew it would do and that was create attention um because you know it was one of those films that would and i knew people would see it because it was something i wanted to see and if I want to see it, then there's got to be many other people that want to see it. And they did, and you know, they flocked. They flocked and, and people saw it. You know, we were only put out in 40 screens, um, and they were full. Considering the release that we did have, I think we did an outstanding business, you know, in, in the time that we've, the film's been out. Yeah, I'm proud, but I don't really get excited because, you know, I know what, what Hoods and I went, what went through working on it. Um, I know the struggles we had to get it made. I know the struggles we've had since we got it made and how many people tried to stop it coming out. The aftermath of the film actually being made and coming out, that actually suddenly it is becoming an important film in, in the British um, film landscape. Uh, in it, it's, gonna, it's had its time, it's, gonna make, it's made its mark, but actually this isn't going to go away. The, the bottom line is we got it out and it, it did well. It did, it, it did very well. And you know, the reason I don't get excited about stuff is, uh, about it is because, you know, if people think that we've done well now, they should see what we've got planned. And now it seems as if we're used to the shagri. We made our beds and now we hate where these beds be. Took nothing at all to part this Red Sea. 
I'm a shackled child, singing the good song of freedom. They've got no pride, they interrupt our grieving. Teardrops dropping for the pain of the world. My best friend dies when she was just a young girl. Left me here to fend for myself, now the pain never leaves. We just learn to cope, so when the devil needs hanging, will you tie up the rope and shout, pull? Let's put an end to this bull, Zen thing. How many years before we practice what we preach? How many tears before we truly clinch the peak? Only to find that there is no honey on the moon. Official goon with the unofficial crew.